and it's C sharp um, and ASP.NET Web Matrix code. Not because it's better, it was just easy. It was just I need an HTML page to showcase and so forth. Um, but there's a reason why I set this up so I can show you guys in a bit. What about myself? I'm an ASP.NET MVP um, and ASP.NET Insider, which means that everything I do is ASP.NET. Uh, I also run this little two conferences called ASPConf and .NET Conf. How many of you guys have heard of well, .NET? Okay. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is that this talk was actually inspired by this work that we did with ASPConf and .NET Conf. But I mean, a virtual conference, a virtual conference is unlike HTC or KCDC or anything you go to is, is literally is how do we try to attract as many different people across the globe right, to get the content? but via a YouTube stream or an HD stream. Well, if we go from a conference for 400, which is an HTC, 400 to 600 people, right, that they have, to 47,000, how do you scale that? I mean, try feeding that many people. Try logistically hosting all those people. Well, doing it virtually, the problem just shifts, right? I don't longer have to worry about food, I have to worry about bandwidth. How is the server not gonna crash when everybody wants to go see the keynote? So, all those different things that, that we learned as we were building this, um, these virtual conferences, we kind of put it, uh, I put it into this top. So the agenda is very complex, as you can see. I want to talk about here's some of the problems that we ran into, and here's how we address them. And like I said, it's very interactive. If you have any questions, feel free to um, chime in. All right, first thing, ASPConf, let's start with kind of how it started. Uh, the idea behind the ASPConf and all the virtual conference that we had is that I had little kids. I had a three-year-old and a three-month-old. And going to a conference in Vegas or anything else means that I have to leave the house to go do that. Well, that has a very low Y for seven time. <laughs> right? So justifying it, it was like, well, I would like to learn about the content, but I don't have time to go and the money and the resources to do it. So let me create a conference that people want to go attend, that I want to want to attend, that are the similar boat, right? We all have families, we all have different obligations. So how can we make it a win-win? And it's not really about being there on the day of, 8, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. when this session happens. It's about, hey, it happened, I'll watch it later. Because I may be, tonight, instead of watching you know, Dexter, I'm gonna watch this other session, or whatever, right? You can pick and choose. So that's sort of what we were aiming for. As we grew, uh, we started in 2010. And these numbers are very accurate because we use event right and Google Analytics. <laughs> uh, we started at 1,500. The following year, we doubled to 3,000. These are actually unique sessions. So right? people actually hit in the site during the entire time. Our biggest jump was between 2000, actually, two biggest jumps, 2011 and 2012. And every time we went through every year, we literally had to reinvent the wheel. Because the wheel just got, it was too small to withstand grow from 1,500 to 11,250. Okay? And we actually tried different things, you know, as we were developing uh, the website. And the website wasn't any complicated. It was nothing complicated. It was literally just a database, an application that read stuff from the database, and shoved it out to a web page. That's like every app that we write, right? But believe it or not, that scaled totally different <laughs> with 3,000 people trying to hit it all at, uh, not at once, but in you know, over two days, than it did with 1,500. And these numbers, we're going to keep up. So we have to step back and rather reinvent the wheel and try to figure out how do we we address the problem. And the biggest problem that we ran into, again, was that, hey, people are always going to go to this page, and then they're going to go to this other page, and then they're going to go to this other page, right? We drive data flow diagrams or whatever. So here's how they're going to work. You know, how, here's how they're going to navigate through a system. However, we realized that it never ever does it, right? You design the system, you have a specific way of handling it, and no one ever uses it that way because, oh, what is this button? What is this? What is this? And the reason we know that it was failing because of all the error notifications we were getting, or the tweets, and this is a piece of crap, no one uses it, no one, no one does it. And that looks really bad, right? Because if you're trying to show your case, this is a great conference, use this, and people are saying, I can't even hit the website, that's, you're going to have a bad time, right? So, that's sort of the stuff that we, we realized that we were thinking about this all wrong, right? The old flow, the old way of doing it for this hyperscale that we could hit, we could have one, one to 10 people hit it, we could have 100,000 people hit it. We weren't quite sure, we gotta think of the problem differently. And the biggest thing we ran into was uh, we were serving uh, too much content from one source. I know I read from the slide, but uh, the reason why I say that 
is because when we started the conference, we went to discountasp.net. So for 10 bucks a month, you know, website, you can do whatever you want to. That was great for 1,500 people. 3,000, not so great. Because even though it was 10 bucks, we got hit with a huge bill for bandwidth. It's like, oh crap. So the website worked, but we had more people in there and we hit our cap. And instead of telling, instead of cutting it off, they just say, yeah, we'll just bill you for what you use. <laughs> That's, that's a good business to be if you're this kind of business. <laughs> but if you're trying to roll your own, it's a little bit different. So again, it's just some of those things that we've learned. And the last bullet point is, as a web developer, you're focusing on, on trying to write your own application, you really forget how the internet works, right? It's a series of tubes, right? It's not like a duck run, where everybody understands that, the YouTube analogy there. But what it is, it's like, if I can have a website that can post different resources from across the globe, then I can literally offload that bandwidth so I'm not serving up one specific location. I can now change the DNS if you know my if my network goes down for whatever reason, I can automatically set a lower time to uh, time to live. So I can now redirect to a different ID address. So you're building fault tolerance by stepping back and looking at the system that we don't think about because we're too ingrained in the code or we're too ingrained in the business requirement or shipping and some of And that's when it comes by uh, now you might be saying, oh really, this is something we knew already, we're doing it, but really it was a, it was a shock for us as we were building this. Because I view myself as an intelligent web developer or an application developer, but when the thing failed, and it failed live, I was like, I am not doing something right. right? I'm completely some, missing something altogether. Which, it happens, you know, we're all human, we forget about it, but still, it's just good to sort of step back. And do pieces. So, again, a little bit about the early days. Uh, we did the shirt host into this kind of ASP.net. Don't get me wrong, they're a great host, but we outgrew them in a year when we had them. And uh, the fun part is that how many of you guys have ever gotten a 503 on your website? That's both an exciting time and a very, very scary time. <laughs> it's exciting because, yes, we got a bunch of people. Crap, we're down. What do we do? How do we bring it back up? And literally, it happened to us during the keynote. And you might be like, okay, why is that important? Well, if you have a virtual conference and you're streaming video, and the only way to that to get to that video stream is to go to the website that is not currently there, people are not going to watch the keynote. How do you bring it back? It took about 15 minutes to literally spin up a new website, redirect everything, and let you know go from the dark side of the moon to the other side of the moon, which the speaker didn't know. So we got just a flame war on Twitter. It was like, this is horrible, blah, 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 blah. Well, we weren't planning that we are going to get 503 in our keynote. Now we know that, hey, every keynote we're going to get 503. Let's work very hard so we don't get 503. At the same time is that uh, we get, you know, for 10 bucks a month, it, it was good enough. But to go to the next level, we're talking about 50 bucks a month. If we needed bigger servers and everything else. Now we have to maintain virtual machines. We have to build this up. Which, don't get me wrong, it, it's fun. If you're into that, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. well, I mean that it's it's fun if you get it working right, right? It's not fun if you forget about it, which you typically do, because you you you're heavy hitting for two days, and after that you forget about it, and then you have like thirty days of updates that you have to do, or it just becomes a nightmare, and it's just you're back at square one. So that's what I mean by that. And again, we only had one machine, so we couldn't like it. It was literally just flipping. From one, from one location. So how do we fix it? We use this thing called the cloud. Uh, because it really allowed us to take the concept of, we have this one server, we, we're FTPing into it, we're dropping these files here, doing X, Y, Z, all these wonderful things that we're used to, and, and literally stop worrying about them. Stop worrying about it from the perspective that now we can just focus on what are the services, what are the expectations, how do we design to fail? Because this thing is going to fail. And the only people that should know that it failed should be us. Right? It would be cool if we could take the time and actually do that in our day to day job to figure out, okay, this, we know this is going to fail. Not because we did a horrible job at it, it's because we are not in control of X, no bandwidth, or the users, or the browser, or whatever thing that we do across the board. We're always running to an issue that we really can't control. So, designing for failure first and failing silently and quickly is always a good a good approach to take. So, anyway, so how do we fix it? <clears throat> Believe it or not, we started 
at the low level. So remember when I told you about the keynote at Five Hundred Three, you get a new one. We need a more robust DNS. And Google, I mean Google, GoDaddy DNS is not robust DNS. Uh, it works great for a simple site, but it falls miserably compared to everything else because you have to switch on the dot and you have to set a lower time time to live. So what we ended up doing is we ended up looking at different uh, DNS providers that we can use APIs for. So when we deploy, we can say, hey, by the way, we're deploying to station, we're deploying to X, how do we flip it? How do we do X, you know, be out HTTP posts so we're more aware of what's going on? The biggest saver out of all of it is this bad boy, content delivery network. How many of you guys using a, explicitly using a CDN, content delivery network right now? No one. Oh, well, you don't count. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> so, so why are you using a CDN? Because the cache is not close to the user. Because the cache is what? Closer to the user. Closer to the user. Wow, well, why, why is that important? It's in my server every time. Really? So that means that your server does less, right? And the user thinks it's right there. So, <coughs> images. How many of us have, you know, get, uh, if there are any designers in the room, I apologize for this. Uh, how many of you get the PS, the three bag PSD, and it's all slid up, and a bunch of slices, and like, make it look cool because it looked great in that Photoshop. <laughs> and now you got like 30 gigs worth of images that you have to like flush to the browser, and every time you click it, you get 30 new gigs, right? Well, if you can take that and put it on a CDN, and you have something more established for caching, and say, hey, only down, it's the logo, it's not going to change. No, request it back every month. Every whatever, you're sending less data. And really what you're sending is are now the deltas. Right? There's an old uh, back in the day when I break back Fuji closer. And anybody get the analogy there? So there's an old Microsoft interview question. It's like, how do you move Mount Fuji? And the whole purpose of the question is to get you to think from a product and program management perspective, how do you solve this problem? You never encountered this before. How would you do it? There is really no answer because you really can't physically move Mount Fuji, right? The, the approach you should be taking is, why do I need to move Mount Fuji? What is, what is the intent that I'm trying to get to? If the whole purpose is to make you feel closer, is good enough showing you a picture of Mount Fuji? Or making you think you're right there? There are so many different answers, but you've got to explore everyone by asking more questions and interacting. And that's one of the things we realize is by using the CDN, we can offload all that traffic. And by mean all that traffic, when we get... Uh, uh, ACCOM in 2000 and whatever the last date was 12. Uh, we had on static traffic in our CDN for two days six gigs worth of static traffic. And it was literally just the CSS, the JavaScript, the images for two days. Now, some sites may have less than that over a month or a six month period of time, but we didn't have to serve any of it. Someone else did. And the best part of the moment it was served, it was cash. And we were still getting billed for it because Amazon's going to bill you for it, right? Uh, just like any good company should, if you're selling services like that. But we were just paying for bandwidth. And the best part about it, it never went back to this, never did anything. It was just like, oh, it's here. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. You just send it down. That was, a, that was fun lesson learned there as well. And I'll show you some of these things. Again, uh, ad hoc provisioning. Uh, like I mentioned, one site went down, the other one went more, uh, we had to go bring it up. Doing that, we have to be faster at our operations. So how do I copy literally one machine that I, I really can't even RDP into? Because it's the end of the Hello Services app. <coughs> to clone it over here. And my clone it is like, copy the files or do something. So we have to get better. It's like, okay, well, if this thing goes kaput, how do we spin this other thing one quick? Or even better, how do we just don't worry about it and the thing just automatically scales? Not horizontally, not vertically, right? Because there's a difference. For, uh, vertically scaling is I need more GBs, right? I need more CPUs, I need more cores, which you might, depending on kind of what workload you're doing. But when you talk about scaling horizontally, now you can say, I now have 30 one core virtual machines with half a gig of RAM doing all this work. And guess what? That means I've got 30 cores. And, you know, whatever gigs are in, I can't do that. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's the, the stuff that we started realizing is that the, mo the, the moment we go smaller, or we go shared cores over there, or, or anything between, we can actually leverage it and pay more, pay, uh, sorry, pay less for more. So what I mean by that is that 
we realized that our bill, when we ran it on, uh, we used Azure just because everything we built was A speed on that. Our Azure bill was a dollar to four dollars, depending on how size the work machine, over two days. And after that, when we're done, we just scale back down because the conference was over. Our Amazon for the six gigs I was talking about, what we did, that was a dollar twenty-five. Dollar twenty-five. Dollar twenty-five for the six gigs of static content. That was it. Yeah, it was that cheap. And then we, we tried it for another one for testing, and we said, okay, why did we have Amazon just serve all the content and literally just have Azure be the the just the engine to cache HTML? And it was like I think it, like maybe seventy cents more. And so it was awesome. I mean, I had Scott said before, right? And, 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 and that's the thing I'm trying to get to is that it's if you look at the scale and kind of what you're trying to deliver, it all depends on how you architect your system and how you look at it. The technology is there. You can do a lot of in house, right? Like I, uh, my previous employer, uh, we dropped about over the five years over there. We did one uh, hardware purchase, and that was about one point seven five million dollars. And as of last, last year, we had a $2 million hardware purchase. So that's three over, you know, amortize it, depreciate it, all that fun stuff. $750,000 of that was storage for a single unit for 10, uh, 10 terabytes of storage. Not redundant 10 terabytes of storage. That means that if I want another 10 terabytes to mirror it, literally across the data center and everything else, I have to spend another $750,000 to go do it. That's a big chunk of change. That's a hell of a lot. <laughs> if you go that way. As compared to just saying, okay, well, whatever it is, I build these smaller things and I pay 10000 And I'm, by the way, I'm now geo replicating. I'm no longer running out of data center anymore. Pretty neat, right? Just, so the kind of scales and the way you actually can go about it to let them. Any questions? Good? Uh, and oh, yeah, the last quote here uh, from Mr. Hanselman. That's one thing we realize that crappy code does cost money on the web. So if you have a website, right, where you go to a page and it takes three seconds to load because you have a bad query or you just have to thread that sleeve, whatever, whatever you're doing behind the scenes, that's going to cost you money because that CPU cycle that that virtual machine and that instance is spinning and not getting any value. Yeah, it's going to cost you pennies on the dollar, right? But it could be doing something else. And the way we actually solved it is uh, we actually cached everything. So what I mean by that is that when we go and get the list of speakers or sessions and everything, we will literally read from the database and say, hey, this doesn't change. Because we're not going to, if we make a change for a session title or an abstract or anything else, we know when we do it because we're going to the administrator site to go do it. Well, the moment that happens, let's invalidate the cache. And let's cache the heck out of this for 12 hours. So we literally hit the database once. And it's that poor person who got up really early in the morning to hit the site. <laughs> Which it wasn't that big of a hit. It was like maybe half a second or whatever it is. Like, oh, it's there. But everything got loaded into memory. And if, they go, and if we deploy this worldwide, that happens you know, 13, 14 times, depending on how many instances you have. That happens every time. Who cares? It's cash that one person paid that toll, and you just go about your business. So, anyway, I'm gonna shut up and kind of we can talk about some of this fun demos. So, one of the things before I start with this is that uh, I think the Sonos is plugged in. Before I start with um, kind of the demos, some of the stuff we did is that. It wasn't something like, oh my gosh, we just discovered this. There's just a ton of information out there, right? Where obviously, prior to doing this, I had experience with doing adult ba load balancers and, and large applications and so forth, but those are very interesting, right? If you're a small company, you're not going to spend $150,000 on load balancing because you don't need to yet. Right? You may need to do it. So, as we were trying to do this, we, we tried to step back and say, okay, well, how have other companies fixed this or addressed these similar problems? And ever since, I've been huge into web operations, and IT operations, because literally that's what it comes down to. It doesn't matter whether you're doing uh, Bootstrap, 
Angular, whatever technology it is, every of those ones are going to come and go, right? I'm sure there's a new JavaScript framework being written right now, so speak. Or probably a hundred, right? Uh, and, and nothing against JavaScript, I'm just saying that's always going to be constant. However, the operations, the way you're going to run your software and your systems, that's going to be specific to everything that you're doing, to the way your company wants to function, to the way you want the system to function. So spend time on that. Yeah, it's cool that we can get this other widget and everything else. That's perfectly fine. But well, that's going to change. And if you build your application to be flexible enough and have smaller components, then your API doesn't matter. It can adapt to it. So, hey, I have a mobile app. I have a, I need, okay, it doesn't matter. I have a web client. I can develop on that get my API. It's the same backend system that my web, uh, my front end uses. Right? But it allows you to give you ability to say, hey, time to market. Now I can actually... You know, make make bank on this new feature because you know there's there's apparently a Facebook for dogs now that you were talking about or Facebook for cats. Like now we can actually write the Facebook for dogs website where it filters all the data, but it's only specific. We don't think about it. Now. We think about it. Oh, this gigantic mess. Thing. Anyway, that's my soapbox. Ah, uh, and did you do that, Ryan? Because you're old. there it is. Anyway, uh, scaling Instagram. I had it here. Uh, Mike Krieger, he's actually one of the co-founders of Instagram. He's employee uh, number two and wrote a lot of the systems behind the scenes. And uh, this is, if you want to know kind of what Instagram, when you come to Instagram, or know about Instagram, or at least some pictures of it. This is a 185 slides of what they've learned on Instagram. And now, Instagram ran on AWS for many years until it got bought out by this little company called Facebook. And then it still ran on AWS, and then they said, hey, bring it over. And then they realized that Facebook didn't have the capacity to run that bandwidth that Instagram was requiring. Because HTML is different than images, would have thought. <laughs> right? Uh, so they had to go back and re-engineer a lot of different things. So this is a great kind of overview of what they did here. And uh, I'm just going to play this quick video. Not, not the presentation, it's a quick video. I don't expect it in terms of user base and data. So, hold on. Um, you may know Instagram, you hopefully know Instagram, we're a way of capturing and sharing the world's moments on your mobile devices. We launched on iOS originally right. in 2010. This is actually, Android, not for the video, this is actually part of Facebook developer series. Kind of on it's on Facebook, not on YouTube. So you want to know how, scaling how, how you know, and the things happen behind the scenes of Facebook, people go watch these. These are actually, the people who are sitting here, those are Facebook engineers, talking to other Facebook engineers. There were Google engineers talking to other Google engineers. Here's how we saw that, here's how we saw why. And they're just stepping through. Um, we had 150 million with yeah. six engineers. I think like four of them were sitting. In That's a program. crazy number. 150 million um, so users from six engineers. Um, That's a crazy website. Of open source technology with thousands and thousands of other engineers. So if you want to know those slides that you're talking about, that essentially is this presentation. Working on the structure. So what I hope you guys got out of today is really interesting. Just because it was it was just different for different approaches. Right? Anyway. Uh, and obviously, believe it or not, there's an uh, Instagram dash engineering and Tumblr when it's up, because it's Tumblr. <laughs> okay. uh, so, yeah, it's migrating from AWS to FP. Not a great post. Right? There's, again, there's no point for you to run your wheel. Right? Whether you're writing Node, Java, Rails. Uh, how many of you actually do Rails right now? No one does Rails? Is it, is it no longer hip? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's the hip thing? Node. How do you scale Node? You don't know. No one has scaled Node. Actually, it's funny you talk about how do you scale Node. But I'm talking to Kathy about this. Is that um, anybody have this little company called Skype? If they do like I don't know video stuff. Um, anyway, they got bought out by Microsoft, right? A couple of years ago, and and the migration between my, well moving them from their current infrastructure to Microsoft infrastructure. Has been several years in the running, and it's not that they're rewriting everything into Windows because they run their Linux box. Actually, they run a lot of stuff in Node behind the scenes. And the one thing that again, engineers talking to engineers, smart people talking to smart people trying to solve the problem, they actually approach the ASP.NET team and saying, "Hey, we we're having trouble with Node. Node doesn't scale for this specific because single thread, right? Back in, because that's the way it works." It's like, great, well, how do you scale Node? You add more 
threat, you add more virtual machines to handle this. So now you have 30, you know, 3,000, 6,000 servers to handle all the background threats behind the scenes that are happening so you can connect chat or do X with these background services. They took a spike with .NET, and I'm not doing this to sell that. Right? I'm just saying it from the perspective of stepping back and making the problem. They took it and said, okay, well, how many, how many concurrent users can we run per box? They can run about 3,000 concurrent users per, per box. And that's for different, all, the different node, all the different nodes in node, right? Uh, uh, the, the, or the worker processes. They took a spike, took that same ser one of the same services that can do that, they rebuilt it in uh, ASP.NET and C-Sharp, right? And ASP.NET Web Services. They went to uh, the original test without any optimizations, about 10,000 units. So they went from 3,000 to 10,000. And I was in the same size box. It wasn't like they tweaked anything and anything I was seeing. As they went better, they were approaching close to 15 to 17,000 users, depending on them. So their infrastructure went from something this large to something this small. And since now it's in ASP.NET, which means Node can run on um, anything and anything, Heroku and so forth, that now they can say, okay, well, I can take this application and deploy it on Azure for both my Node pieces and my C sharp pieces. And this infrastructure that we used to have now goes away. That means that now we can actually target. Xbox One. We can target mobile devices because now we can handle more concurrent connections. And rewrite was necessary, not because it was done wrong, it was because you found a different approach to the problem. So, anyway, that's a little side story there. I like that. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it's a fun uh, It's a fun one. It's not as cool as Ruby on Rails, obviously, <laughs> by the ton of people doing it right now. Uh, so, I brought Heroku here uh, just as a fun. Uh, how many of you use Heroku? Like just one person. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, why? Why do you like Heroku? I mean, not, don't, don't get me wrong. I like Heroku. Heroku is awesome. I'm not using it. Okay. It's, 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 it's just a play around. Right. It's, it's, it's super easy to do. Hey, and the reason why I bring it up is that uh, I know uh, friends do Ruby uh, and Node, Java, and Python, and uh, we can talk about you know running stuff in AWS. AWS is great, but you have to maintain a lot of stuff, and it's always like a battle of which cloud is better or whatever. And again, not doing anything. And they were telling me about this website called Commits Logs from Last Night. How <laughs> 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 many you heard of this website? Right? Yeah. You know the text from last night is like I was drunk or whatever, nothing stupid. Well, imagine this: my co-developer from GitHub. And uh, the funniest thing about it was like <laughs> they told me go here. Scroll down to the bottom, and you, every time you keep scrolling down, they just keep fetching more. And just do a control find and find the word Heroku. <laughs> so I did that. Heroku. Uh, Heroku. So adding chip for Heroku. <laughs> if you go to the next one, is. Uh... <laughs> and it's funny, the reason why I laugh and I get my big in Heroku. Is that you can you can AWS or anything else? Like the reason why that's important is because you, if you have to change your application to where you're going to deploy it, that's a pain that you're not realizing right now. Stop it. Because if you go to deploy somewhere, there's a horrible word in here. I, I didn't actually say it. Right. <laughs> Completely untested base logic. I like it. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So this is the uh, if you went and again spend and kill it. Day or two, <laughs> come to, come to this, and it's a bunch of stuff. Everywhere. Uh, but anyway, if you have to change your application to do some of that stuff, that's where it gets a little more difficult. Right? So that's my rant. All right. So I was talking about uh, it's over here DNS, and remember how I said uh, GoDaddy DNS is not scalable? It's because it's not. Uh, it's a good service. It does great. It's great. What you get, you pay where you get, you know, from it. Uh, as we were shopping around, and I made zero dollars from DNS maybe. I'm just sharing this because it's amazing, especially for the price. It's super amazing. It's um, fifty, I think fifty bucks a year for up to twenty five domains. And that's the business that allows you to have, I think, uh, between two or three million DNS queries. A month. And if you go over, you just have to pay whatever the difference is if you're gone. 
Also, they have an API. So I can write curl scripts, PowerShell, whatever flavor of the month I want to do, it, and I can actually go say, add these. And this is uh, I, one of the things that we started to do with part of the conferences is that um, we started splitting stuff into what we call front office and back office. And, and I, I've been using that word just because in my previous employer we did um, trading. And front office is the brokerage and the traders, right? They're selling, they're sitting there, buy this, sell this, buy this, buy that. They don't care that they're going to get paid because they're not going to get paid. They just sell as much as they can and then they take all that mess and they show it over the counter and say, hey, back office, clear it. And I want my check. Sounds familiar, right, to an analogy in IT. It's like, someone figures out this thing, and then they send it over, and someone's got to do something with it, because it's, we got to deliver on it. Uh, so what we started doing, because of that, is we started splitting our front office and our back office when it comes to, again, IT operations. And since domains are cheap, depending on where you go, we have .NET and we have .com. Our .NET is our back office domain. That is where we run all of our back office services that we need to scale the lights on, doing the pings, doing all the traces, and so forth. That can scale as need be. And if it's down, who cares? We can go fix it. Instead of building that into the app, we're making the app dumber. By dumber, I mean it's just specific on the systems that it needs to build. So if my job is only to take data from the database and spread out there, great. That's all it does. The management site runs in the .NET domain. Because it has a totally different concern. They're both going to hit the same database, but it's in cash. I'm not scaling differently. But I now went from $10 to $15 for a domain purchase by just doing two things. Which we don't think about. Right? We just, well, we've got to build the admin screen and this gigantic thing, and it's going to add more. It's like, no, just split that. Have a team work on the features that are going to ship that are customer facing that are important, and have another team. I have another team that um, focuses on the features that are really important because you're going to write once and maintain forever. So split your life, split your system. Again, we don't think about it. We put everything one mile of the gap or behind the scenes. And everything you build should be built using with the concept of services or APIs. Because then I can actually build different automation. So if I commit to GitHub, if I use GitHub or Bitbucket or anything else, I need to go through X and do Y. Um, a good example of that is that. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll wait for that one. Uh, here's the demo. But anyway, so here I'm using, and you can look at, I've actually used uh, a bit of everything. I use uh, Office 365, I use Azure, I use um, Google uh, Apps for Business, and it's all back here. I can go and edit it I wanted to. I can go edit it from my phone if I wanted to. But it's not like I have to be here and actually do it. Um, and here's the bullseinaltech.com, right? So here's the actual front office. Where you configure this. And the nice thing about it is that I can, I can go to this domain, for example, um, where I have cloud scale. And um, let me show you here. Go to cloud scale. This, this is the demo, by the way. Because I don't think that. And you'll see this web page, right? So, and we'll, 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 we'll go over this here in a bit. I can go here, see server information, whatever it's out there, it's all, it's all great. But the nice thing about it is that now, I can go and configure this. If you can see. Maybe it's a scotch. Um, <laughs> CloudScale.com will point to this traffic manager in it. We'll cover that here in a second. But my time to live is 900 seconds. So I can actually tweak this up and down. I can make it 1,800 seconds. I can go whatever, wherever. And I can programmatically do it. So remember I was talking about dark side of the moon from one to the other when we had to do this? Now I can really control that via a lower time to live. So as my as the client saying, hey, is this site still up? Still set up? Oh yeah, it's right here. By the way, uh, it's no longer this IP, it's not this IP. Or it's this DNS for CNN. And automatically the DNS handles it. And I pick a DNS provider that is robust enough that allows me to do that. It's all included in my $50 per year. Again, we don't think about it, because we don't think about DNS. Not because it's not important, it's just because, oh, that's the dot com, or that's the scene, or that's the idea. 
But the more you start developing and thinking about that with mind, it makes things a lot simpler for you. And why is that important? Is that it's important because if you start bringing in different services, trying to bring them back in services, such as AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, this becomes, it's like a game changer, because now you can actually change things in the down. Now, like I said, we use Amazon for all of our content delivery. Doing computer in Amazon using .NET stack, it's doable, but it's required, it's busy. Like right? you have to spend virtual machines, you have to spend network, and so forth. So if you're doing it now, Godspeed. And just, it's, it's, it's not like, again, it's hard. It's just servers, virtual machines, updates. It's just, it's just like having a rack in the back, right? And doing something. Uh, but everything else that they have out here, Cloud Search, Glacier is awesome, Kinesis, RDS, MapReduce, Elastic Cache, all of those services in your application can leverage, whether it's on-prem or it's running on Azure or Rogue or anything else, right? There's no concept of, I only got to use one cloud. I should use the cloud that's best for the job. And I can tell you this, that I, even though we're running our computer on Azure, because again, it's just .NET, the CDN in Azure is not as cool as Cloud, right? <laughs> and that's putting it kind of <laughs> uh, Just because there's more API around it, there's more codes, there's more integrations, there's more settings on it. So why am I gonna move this over here to put it on the same cloud where I, I'm, I'm actually losing features? The users don't care. They, they care if it's not there. So let me make sure that I work very hard so it, it is there. Anyway, uh, the one thing I was going to show you is that as simply we make this, we actually use S3 buckets. How many of you heard about an S3 bucket? It's right in a big folder or a hard drive. It's got don't put whatever you want to do in there. It's great. We have different ones. And the one thing I was going to show you here is that I've actually set up different ones. Ignore the other ones too. And I actually use Cloudberry backup. By the way, you should use it. Cloudberry is awesome. Backup virtual machines, compressing, and everything else. It's awesome to us. Um, so we have CDN, that dev points. It's a side thing that when I have free time to work on. Uh, CDN, Git Statico. Uh, the reason why it's called Git Statico, uh, the, the, the organization in which we run all the virtual conference is called Git Share. And uh, we I think we were drinking, and that's the name we came up with. Uh, but anyway, it's just static co, because static co is actually Spanish for it without the E, right? So we were just playing on words. So it's our CDN, that's where everything points to, and then we just trigger off everything off it. I literally created this one this, this afternoon for this demo because I was using a different name, it just got confusing. But what I did was literally just create the bucket. Create the bucket, name it, whatever, blah, 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 dump files in it. And one of the files that, uh, the tools that I use is this little tool called uh, Cloudberry Explorer, S3 Explorer Pro. So as you can see here, whoa, I have the same bucket that I can go to AWS, get my user, and I can literally drag and drop files from my desktop out to them, rather than upload. Like, whoop de doo welcome to like 1995, right? <laughs> it's not about that. It's about what actually can happen when you actually upload it. So one of the best things that you can do with AWS that is enabled out of the box for every request is this. Every time you upload something, you're actually going to steal CPU out of your machine or whatever server you're at, so you're going to compress a heck of it. JavaScript, CSS, images, you're going to compress it. You're going to GSIP it as much as I can. So instead of paying for cycles on the cloud that are going to cost me whatever amount of money, I have this thing sitting here that I can use the cycles. So as I upload by dragging and dropping, dropping, I'm taking all the stuff that's compressing and sending out, and by the time it gets there, it's a smaller file. And it's GSIP enabled. So whenever someone actually requests it from the web browser, it's going to send you the compressed file and then it's going to explode. But it's less work that I'm doing on the server side, and it's more of like, hey, here's an image here, here's an image there. Pretty cool, huh? And it's some of those things that we don't think about. How many of us compress our PNGs and JPEGs? Like, just one person. <laughs> Why do you do it? Um, 
to reduce response time. Okay, so there's there's that aspect of it. But at the same time, if you have a, if you have a JPEG and it's got, you can bring it down to thirty percent or fifteen percent or whatever that is, and actually have not have lock, don't lose any quality on it. You get a smaller file, and then you compress it on top of that. You go from you know from thirty k to fifteen k to down to ten k. That's less stuff you have to send it, which again affects your bill. So if you start thinking about this, it makes your performance better, but it doesn't kill it doesn't kill the wall. Again, it may sound obvious, but it's one of those ah, moments that we run into. So anyway, S3, use it, it's awesome. Uh, I have a referral code, by the way, <laughs> if you want to use it. So the reason why we use it, simple, quick, uh, and it's, we can deploy it to any region, right? So just like any data center, Heroku, Azure, everything else, we can say we can put it in this region, this region, this region, and this region. We typically use the default one, which is in uh, North Virginia, right? Uh, just because that's the default region. Not, it's not because it's better, just it's easy. Uh, but the thing about it, what we do is we go out and we actually use cloud to create our CDN that we can then tailor as need be. As you can see here, I have quite a bit of CDNs. Uh, and these are cool for this specific reason, is that I can now actually go through go through the wizard. Uh, <coughs> and actually, before I start this one, this distribution, sorry. If you do any video, this RTM for uh, flash streaming, you can actually put the video out there and actually serve it as a, as a nice flash video server. And you just pay for content. You don't have to host your own server. You don't have to have a, a, a virtual machine out there running all the software. It just it doesn't. Drop your files. We'll handle encoding. So, and the cool part about it too is that if you're actually doing live encoding, so if we take that, if they take that camera, plug it in, and stream it up to it through Flash server, it will actually be delivered through the CDN without writing zero code or configuring it to something, which is pretty pretty awesome. We haven't gotten to that crazy level yet. Yet. <laughs> but we again leverage the heck out of the out of the web. And we say just get started. We can actually from here cherry pick the different S3 buckets that we have. Right? So we have an S3 buckets of uh, CDN, whatever, whatever, whatever. But the cool part about it is that nothing really stops you from actually writing HTTP slash slash mobile.com. So this is why I like Cloudflare. I can have custom origins. So what is a custom origin? A custom origin is anything where actually is going to search that in content. So if I have a website that I need to make web scale, like it was talking about what we did, is that, oh, okay, I'll just go to the free tier of Heroku. That's good enough, right? But I'm limited on CPU, bandwidth, and everything. Pages. doesn't matter. It's not much content. I'm going to set that as a custom origin. And then in my DNS, I'm going to send whatever custom address that I have as the source. So when my user goes to www.mywebsite.com, it's there. But it's all being served from Python out of a free hero group. It's all blossom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was one of those, like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. What else can we do? Uh, and the reason why that's important is that some cloud providers, like at the time when we did it with Azure, they, went, they weren't supporting custom domain names. So you couldn't go to www.myconference.com. Crap. You can do it, but you have to pay a bunch of money. And then we were playing around, I was like, wait a minute, what if we do it all for here? And we did. And it was super awesome. <laughs> super. Uh, anyway, as you go down, you can say, okay, both HTTP and HTTPS. So if you do schema-less URLs, how many of us do schema-less URLs for resources? Just have it. You know what I mean by schema-less URLs? Right? If you have an image tag, source equals, instead of putting HTTP or HTTPS colon slash, you just put slash slash. And whatever it serves it, it just magically works. Magically works. Um, and then you can pick whatever you want to in here and so forth. So Anyway, CloudFront, and uh, show you the the one we're going to be using. And I'm going to the distribution settings. And it's pretty simple. So it just talks about distribution ID. Here's what it 
unique ID in Google, I'm sorry, in AWS, deployed status, are we doing cost cookie logging, how are we doing, and I was just cheap and I said, let's just use US and Europe, but if you have a global presence and you want to do every single data center of the AWS in the world, you can do it, you just pay a little more, like maybe a cent, um, uh, because it's all on how much you consume. Domain name, so this is the custom domain name that uh, AWS gave me, which is gorgeous. It doesn't matter, because what I'm doing is I'm using uh, my my CNS record. So let me go to my back office. Right here. Oh, nope. And that's where I'm referencing that cloud. So I can now have CDN that whatever dot com he started to go dot net whatever. What did they reference? Okay, just like you would do any other thing. Now, why is that important? So if I come over here, and if I go to actually CDN, I was on the This is like so. This is a fast cookie-less domain intended for static content. And can anybody tell me why that's important? Cookie less. Bandwidth. Why is it important with bandwidth? Bandwidth where? In or out? Cookies get sent. Did you know that? Like, right? That's that's the wonderful thing about the web. It's like, oh, well, the cookie will get sent. It doesn't matter. It's whatever.com. Well, if I'm downloading an image, why do I need to send all the cookies that are tied to my domain? I just need the image. So don't have your apps send 10K worth of traffic, out traffic, to the website that's just going to bring you and give you an image or JavaScript file. Set up a different domain so you are leveraging the way the browser and the web works to, oh, don't know that domain, I'm not going to send you cookies. Even though I'm rendering food.com or whatever, I'm going to go to food.net to get all my content. Different cookies, not going to send them. That's Again, we don't think about it because we're busy. So in here, I can actually set up whatever I want to configure it and be and be just off, you know, off to the races. At the same time, I can actually go. Um, I can have multiple different origins. If I, if I want to say this URL, this other URL, and find it. The thing about that's cool about this is this invalidations. So I have a static site and I'm dropping files to. Right? Uh, yeah, it's three buckets. And invalidation is just what the word I invalidate. So whatever's in cache is no longer valid. For whatever reason, right? It's hot outside, late, whatever you want to do. Right? And we actually use the heck out of this. Because one of the things we did is, uh, actually, I'll go to the whiteboard. Yeah, you're fine to Here's what we used to do is that we have our CDN out here, right? And we had our Azure website. Remember when I said that we were using the CDN as the distribution for Azure? And then everybody in their world would be using this? Well, if I'm updating my website, right, so here's my code. And I'm pushing it out to Azure. What's going to tell this thing to do something? That the set website something because I told you cash for like a day. And Uber is like, yeah, that's, that's trading one problem for another, right? What's going to do it? Well, <laughs> good question. We literally spent like a day <laughs> trying to figure it out. How can we do it? And uh, our solution, believe it or not. Uh, I'm bringing this up because we're, we're using this for, these, for the other demo. There's a little bit called GitHub. And a little feature called a webhook. So why is that cool? What we ended up doing, we ended up doing this. And again, this is what we got smarter, front office, back office. This is the iterations that we went through. We would get out better code. All right, so better code here. 
Git commit, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Amen. We need to get out. We had Azure. We had Azure. Azure front office. Azure back office. We would go to GitHub. GitHub would we'd go to a repo, private repo. We don't want people to know our database. Um, and what it would do is, that repo would have two webhooks connected to it. Right? One webhook was to deploy front apps. Go straight out to the site, compile it, render it, render the static thing. The other one would call an API endpoint to an HTTP post with the information of the GitHub commit. So we knew which files changed. See where this is going? We knew which files changed because they were image files. Then we used this little thing called the AWS API to customly create new requests to AWS to embedded in the CDN. Pretty cool. You only invalidated what changed. Exactly. But how much did that save? It saved us not money. It saved us the ability to like, well, this page hasn't been refreshed. We changed the tax and everything else. So what it really was about is impression. Whenever we did a change, we were guaranteed that that content was going to get updated. And be relevant. No. Yeah, it didn't matter. Yeah, it was like if there's three files that change or three URLs that change, it was like, well, this one changed, this one changed. It could have been tax, it could have been layout. We don't know what it was. Just update those. All right. There are popular pages. Go we'll flush them out. Well, the front was all it did. The front was just literally a custom origin, piece. so it was dumb. No one was hitting the back. No one was hitting the front. The only thing that was hitting the front was CDN AWS. So it was just a proxy. Men in the middle. Oh, yeah, you want this page? Did I hit it? Yeah. Okay. Cache it. You want that page again? You got it. You got it. You got it. Do I have it? No. Go fetch it. That's all CDN did. And we did it for like free. This was a this was a free instance. This was a free instance. Pretty cool, huh? And we call this guy the neuralizer. <laughs> <laughs> but we did, right? So we call it the neuralizer. Uh, we have fun when we come up with a new concept, but we name it after either Marvel stuff. Like we have a product called Mjolnir, like the Hammer Thor. You can figure it out when that what that one does. Uh, the uh, the Tesseract and so forth, just because we like to have fun. But yeah, that would be called Neuralizer because it was just flushing. But using GitHub or Bitbucket or something that allows you.